Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Andreas. Um, I'm here to give a talk about the TPM2 ecosystem in Linux and how we're build, trying to build up a community around it. Um, I'm not the original speaker. Originally, uh, Peter was supposed to give a talk. He's from Infineon. I'm not from Infineon, so the schedule got kind of mixed up, uh, just if you're wondering. So I'm actually, so who am I? I'm, as I said, Andreas. I've been working with TPMs for on and off for 13 years now. Um, I work for Fraunhofer, which is a R&D institution in Germany. And there I have a group, a research group, focusing on trustworthy platforms um, with a large focus on, T uh, on TPMs. I'm also a TCG member, so writing the specs that then I have to implement, unfortunately, because um, being the maintainer of um, three of the projects from the ecosystem, um, the core library, and two others that I'll just talk about real quickly. Um, just real quick, what do we do at Fraunhofer? Well, we put TPMs into things uh, for fun and profit, um, be that like railway systems, as you see up there, or uh, these famous cars, uh, so these electric vehicles that you see there. Um, yeah, they all can benefit from it. Um, so what we're going to talk about, I'll give you a very, very quick introduction to what TPMs are, um, then to what the, the TSS, the TPM software stack is, and quickly talk about uh, existing TSS software that's already out there and being shipped. Um, and this is everything that I already talked about at Linux Plumber. So for those of you who were there at that talk, uh, you can go to sleep until uh, the next topic point, which is what's new, because that's um, where new stuff is going to be. Um, and then I'll talk real quickly about the community we're trying to build. So what is a TPM? Um, a TPM is a little security chip a smart, with smart card-like capabilities that uh, nowadays gets put into almost every consumer level, laptop, desktop, whatever. Um, big thanks here to Microsoft for the Microsoft Lo uh, Windows logo program that requires TPMs, because that allows each and every one of us to actually make use of them under uh, other operating systems as well. Um, a TPM is, as I said, usually it's a chip that's connected to the main CPU via um, LPC, SPI, or I2C buses. Um, there's also TPM implementations in firmware. Um, I don't know, there's been like TEE, Trust Zone, whatever kind of uh, implementations, or in the what I still call the Southbridge, I don't know what you call it nowadays. Um, so this is where the module lives. And then we have the CPU on the other side where I'll be focusing on because that's where the, uh, the, the software stack lives and where the applications that actually make use of it live. Um, just a very quick um, pointer if you want to get started with TPMs. Well, you just take whatever laptop, desktop, whatever you have. Um, the TPM is automatically discovered via the ACPI tables by the kernel, and you already have a dev TPM zero device and can just go ahead and use our software. You might have to activate it in, in BIOS. That depends on your specific um, device. Or if you like to tinker around with raspberries, um, there's a bunch of Raspberry daughter bots. And uh, nowadays, Raspbian even has uh, support for TPMs. So you just change those two lines in the, in the config TXT, and you're all there. And just go ahead and go ahead um, and, and uh, follow the instruction from the install MD from, from the upstream projects. All right, so what is uh, the TSS? As I said, the kernel driver exposes to user space just a character device, def TPM0. And this character device consumes byte buffers and spits out byte buffers. And so you either have to do a lot of manual tinkering around with it, or you can go ahead and utilize a, a, a software stack, kind of a middleware, I would say, for, for accessing the TPM. So the TCG, that's the um, standard, the, the specification consortium where the TPM originates from. Um, we also defined a set of specifications for a software stack, um, specifying APIs that you might want to be using. And then we have TPM2 TSS, which is an implementation of those libraries. It's not the only software stack for utilizing the TPM out there but it's, uh, as far as I know, the only open source standards compliance one. Um, as I said, it provides 
um, APIs for, for application integration. Um, and our hope is uh, to get adoption either by the TSS directly or to have additional modules that are already integrated with software to pick up TPM functionality so, uh, such that it can seamlessly um, integrate. So what, what kind of APIs that we specify there? Um, this is basically the stack as you would have it, the software stack on your, um, on your device. The TPM device driver, as I said, usually lives within the kernel space. And then you can have a, um, because the TPM is somewhat resource limited, because it's a small chip, shouldn't cost too much money, um, you need some kind of resource manager. So um, you can either have a resource manager inside the kernel nowadays, um, which you can access via dev TPM RM0 instead of dev TPM0, or you can have a user space resource manager that um, also provides you this functionality of multiplexing the access to the TPM device so you don't applications don't step on each other's uh, toes. On top of that, we have uh, the TPM command and transmission interface, TCTI. This is basically a IPC abstraction layer because we already figured that you might be accessing the TPM via the user space resource manager, you might be accessing the TPM via the kernel space resource manager, you might be wanting to access a TPM simulator during the development. So we already designed into the whole approach this idea of an abstraction layer that you have underneath the actual user space libraries, and during initialization you can define which kind of TPM you want to connect to and in which way you want to connect to it. And nowadays there's even like TCTI modules that uh, talk from an SGX enclave uh, to the actual uh, user space or that work uh, in UFI environments if you're into that kind of hacking. And then further up, those are the most interesting APIs for user space development. We have the system API, which was the first API we defined, the enhanced system API, yay for names and the feature API, the latest, latest edition. And depending on what kind of application scenario you're trying to solve, either of these APIs might fit you. The system API is mostly designed for highly constrained embedded devices where we don't require any file I.O., we don't um, have crypto libraries, backend crypto libraries compiled into the source, for example, or where you don't want to do any heap allocations because the interface is designed such that it works in a stack-only allocation way or global variable allocation way. The Enhanced System API um, then brings some nicer features. So this is what you probably want to aim for for most of your low-level design on an actual system because it does a lot of the bookkeeping um, for you. So it, uh, when you communicate with the TPM, you need to store certain metadata for all of the TPM objects. You need to calculate HMAX for authentication of commands and responses exchanged with the TPM. And that's all the kinds of things that the Enhanced System API does for you. And then we have the Feature API, the latest edition, um, which provides a lot of convenience functions. And opposed to the other two, that we're kind of bottom up, we look at the TPM functionality and design an interface to access it. Uh, with the feature API, we went a top down design approach. So we looked at use cases and defined um, functionality for those use cases. But I'll go a little more into detail on this uh, later. So here's a quick project overview. As I said, this is about the, the ecosystem that we're trying to build. And as you see, we have currently, what, two, four, six, seven projects in the core. Um, community space that are um, enabling you to use the TPM. And then there's also other um, projects that are not in our, well, in our namespace, I would say, on GitHub, that are also starting to, to pick up um, functionality for TPMs based on our libraries. Um, the one that I'm most involved with is, for example, Crypt Setup, which I'm going to visit uh, a little later. But there's also OpenConnect, SwongSwans, which are two VPN solutions that you might be familiar with. Um, yeah. So those core projects, um, we try to keep them as low profile as possible. So here is just an example on um, the dependencies we have for the core tools uh, and the resource manager, because there's been some, some rumors running around that it's so complicated and you need so many dependencies in order to build the TSS. 
That's actually not true because we currently build with only one dependency, which is libcrypto or libgcrypt for the cryptographic operations in the background. And coming up uh, with the next release will be um, also linking against libcurl and libjsonc, but that's three dependencies and nothing more. Um, yeah, just to debunk a myth here. Um, Going further down to the user space resource manager again, um, so we do inter process communication using libdbus. And since dbus and, uh, and glib go along so nicely, um, that's also a dependency. And the tools, again, two dependencies OpenSSL and, uh, and lib, uh, libcurl. Um, other projects you might be interested in uh, the Python bindings, which I'm not going to go too much into detail here or not going to mention it at all anymore. And the TOTP, which is a PC to human authentication process, um, thinking about evil maids or, I don't know, uh, airport security uh, infiltration, stuff like that. All right. Um, the community we're building um, only builds on, uh, upon people. So we have this rather large set of maintainers from several companies, some from from my research institute, some are from Infineon, some, uh, a lot of them are from Intel. And uh, always have to highlight, we have a volunteer hobbyist maintainer, which is always great to have in such a project. And overall, we, I counted, we have more than 100 individual contributors by now. So we're trying to actually build up a thriving community, um, which is why we're giving these kinds of talks. Um, other than that, we're trying to um, adhere to common best practices. So we have uh, well, Travis CI with scan build, uh, always aiming for more than 80% test coverage. Um, we're actually now, thanks to the efforts, um, I think it was Imran who did it or John, um, we're now building the CI on, I think, six different Linux distros in Docker containers just to make sure that we're compatible with all of them and also follow the, the latest uh, warnings and scan build findings that you get with newer distributions and newer versions of Clang. So we're trying to follow best practices. And on that note, um, badges, badges, badges. Um, I think we're <laughs> trying to get into the Guinness Book of World Records for the most badges. But I would say each, of, each and every of those badges actually contains some, some very good best practice that we're trying to follow, be that, as I said, coverity or code coverage, um, CII best practice guidelines, or I think one of the latest editions are um, uh, read the docs or looks good to me, stuff like that for doing code analysis or automatic uh, generation of documentation. The graphics uh, you see on the right-hand side, um, this is actually an overview of the packaging we have. Don't be too concerned with the red markers. Um, those are packages that exist. They are just not the latest version. So some of them are from a, an earlier main, minor version release. Um, still, most of them include the latest bug fix releases. And um, as you can see, we have quite some adoption. I think the latest being um, Alpine Linux. And I think there's also some NetBSD stuff uh, going on now. So that's... Uh, pretty cool overall. All right, so what can you actually do with this uh, TSS and TPMs, what already exists? As I said, currently most applications, almost everything that's running TPMs is uh, linking against this ESYS namespace, the libtss2 ESYS libraries. And um, that provides you a one-to-one -one mapping of all of the TPM functionalities. Uh, including also its data types. So you need to know the data types and the general operations of the TSS. Um, what the library does is, first of all, it gives you a nice functional interface, and then it automates for you um, the process of marshalling, unmarshalling, um, metadata handling, encryption sessions, um, session authentications, memory allocation for return types, and it even does some, some detection sequence for TPMs. So it first looks for a user space resource manager, kernel resource manager, kernel, and then for a simulator. So that's um, such that um, you, can, you can most definitely uh, rely on a TPM being found if there is one on your system. Um, also the TPM tools, 
which is a, a collection of command line tools um, since version 4.0, which took a little longer to develop than originally anticipated, but we're finally here. Um, also uses ESUS and also the Python binding, so this is your primary, I guess, low-level interface. Now, what kind of um, actual things or what kind of implementations exist there? So I try to structure this a little from a use case perspective. Um, one of the things you typically wanna, wanna avoid uh, um, in a system is you wanna keep your keys from leaking. And keys and RAM are a pretty bad idea as we've all seen uh, during, during that whole hard bleed thing. Keys on disk are just as dangerous. If you think about, I don't know, people grabbing a hard disk from your, from your server environment, or if you're thinking about the kinds of devices I showed you earlier, the embedded devices, um, you might assume that an attacker is easily capable of removing an SD card from a slot and uh, extracting private keys from there. So what you wanna do is you wanna have some way to prevent them from, well, first of all, extracting the keys, and then even worse, to duplicate the keys, because if they're only removing a smart card or whatever, or steal the device, you could at least know that the key is gone and somebody else has it now. If they copy it, you might not even be aware that there is a duplicate of your device somewhere on the internet. And so the easiest way to do that is using the TPM. And as an example, um, what we have is we have an OpenSSL engine to do that. So if your software is already using OpenSSL for, um, for example, remote authentication of your device, uh, OpenSSL has this mechanism of, of engines where you can load different cryptographic providers into the namespace at runtime, actually, so you don't need to recompile OpenSSL. You only need to install the, the engine libraries on your system and give some config parameters. And then what happens, um, you come up or you, can you actually see the, no, you cannot see the mouse pointer. So what happens is this engine will then, instead of using keys stored directly on disk and loading them into RAM and processing everything in RAM, it will um, load encrypted blobs that are lying around on disk, uh, which are still in, in a PEM format, but a different kind of PEM format. So it's a, T a TPM private key and not a regular private key load those into the TPM where they get decrypted by the TPM, and then hand off all cryptographic operations to be performed by the TPM. That way, um, you know that an attacker who gains access to your application memory cannot do any, uh, any harm, any extraction. So if that was, if you had something like that during the heartbleed cases, of course you would still have to patch your systems, but you could just keep using the same credentials afterwards because only an attacker using Heartbleed would only have been able to capture running sessions, but not be able to um, compromise your long-term secrets because they, those would have been protected by the TPM. Another use case that um, I'm very keen on nowadays is uh, disk encryption. Because I get tired by those long, ugly passwords that you have to type in on every boot in order to um, decrypt your, your disk. Um, so what I want to do is instead I want to just enter a short pin. And um, the problem with short pins is password derivation functions uh, are only as strong as the passwords that you, um, key derivations functions for passwords are only as strong as the passwords you put in. So they're easily brute forceable if you just use a pin for that. Um, however, if you use a TPM, the TPM can be throttled or the TPM actually even has a smart card-like um, lockout mechanism. So if, a, um, if um, a password has been entered too many times um, falsely, the TPM will go into a lockout mode and will have a cool down time usually that you can configure. And so it will block any further authentication for the next hour or two or whatnot or until next reboot. Um, it's even, it's also um, utilizable in, again, other scenarios. If you think about your um, data center, where people can just take a, um, a hard disk from the rack, the problem is, of course, you could theoretically encrypt this hard disk, but the problem remains where do you store the keys for this hard disk encryption? Probably on the hard disk as well, because you cannot have an admin running through the data center trying to type in all passwords uh, into each of the servers on boot. So what you could do instead uh, is use a TPM, store the, um, the, the 
the encryption keys, the actual like on-disk encryption keys inside the TPM, and then if somebody goes along and steals even all of the hard disks and tries to carry them out, um, you know that they cannot access the data itself. Um, same is true for embedded devices. And we're even working towards this attestation capability of the TPM, so you can define the BIOS and kernel configuration that the device shall be in when the TPM releases the keys for disk decryption. Such, uh, that means that an attacker on an embedded device cannot go ahead and easily, they can if maybe more effort is spent by hardware attacks, but they cannot easily replace the SD card with a different SD card to load a different kernel image from and then gain access to the, um, to the credentials for disk encryption. But they actually have to boot your original kernel, which um, prevents a lot of easy extraction methods. So the way we're implementing that is um, together with uh, upstream, because that's what you're supposed to do. Um, so there is an implementation out there hanging around in a, in a merge request that's fully functional actually, and you see the only thing that you have to change is you have to add the dash dash TPM um, to the crypt setup executable and the keys are stored inside the TPM instead of on disk. And um, we utilize the, the JSON-based uh, LUX2 um, on disk format and we just introduced a new type, as you can see, type TPM2. And um, there's the PCR selection up there. Um, currently, I'm in, me and Milan, we're in the process of reworking the architecture a little because you wanted to see uh, this implemented a little differently also to support further use cases going forward. But um, for the next release of Crypt Setup, which should be uh, 2.3, we're expecting to be able to merge this feature into upstream, which would be uh, kind of cool, I guess. Finally, um, as I mentioned earlier already, um, VPN user authentication, there's already two implementations out there. So the idea is that instead of just typing in your username and password, you now have the capability to define that a certain user at a certain PC needs to be present and the users cannot go around and use their private PCs to enter their passwords there um, or usernames there. So there's an implementation for OpenConnect by um, David Woodhouse um, and there's also StrongSwans, which is an, IP so OpenConnect is an AnyConnect compatible open source implementation and StrongSwans is just a, um, is an IPsec implementation. And we, I, I yet have to test that, but theoretically OpenVPN should be easily compatible with the OpenSSL engine that we built as well. Um, but that needs to be verified. All right, so that's what I already talked about during Linux Plumbers, just a recap for everybody who was not there. Um, now what's new? I already teased at Linux Plumbers, and also here that we have a new library coming up that's um, currently taking up a lot of our efforts. Um, so from the TCG side, we released two new specifications. Um, the feature API specification, as I mentioned, it, the idea is to have a top-down approach looking at common use cases and taking away a lot of the flexibility, of course, uh, that you would have from a one-to-one -one mapping to TPM functions, but trying to make it a lot simpler and easier for people to get at. And that's also the reason for the second specification, the JSON and policy data specification. So instead of having the, I have to admit, even after working with those for several years now, the somewhat complicated uh, TPM data structures, we now put everything into JSON so you can more easily edit it and you can especially more easily serialize it out to disk, hand it off to someone else, get it back from disk and just pass it into the API without having to actually understand um, all of the data types. So that's, that was one of the design goals we, we got in there. The next one was um, that even though I cannot understand it, but apparently there's not only cryptographic experts programming out there, but there's actually people who don't know too much about cryptography. So um, we tried to decouple the functional aspects of the API, which is calling into the API for signing or things like that, from the cryptographic side of the API. And we did that by specifying what we call cryptographic profiles. So you can have a security administrator defining cryptographic profiles 
for use with the TPM, so whether you want to be using RSA 1K, RSA 2K, uh, ECC P256, or whatever other curve you want to be using, and they can specify that in combination with like schemes and uh, hash algorithms and define what they are comfortable with. And then you have the programming side where you then only call create key and the key gets created using those profiles. So it was our attempt to decouple those two roles uh, that you have in a typical um, deployment scenario. Another thing we did is we added a key store. Um, so as I said, the TPM is a very constrained device. It only carries around like 10 or something kilobytes of, of NV flash. Um, that needs to be enough for all the keys and all the metadata for the keys, authorization values and whatnot. So usually what you do is you store your key blobs encrypted outside of the TPM and only the TPM knows the key to gain access to those, to those encrypted blobs um, and therefore to the keys themselves. And also you have to keep track of all the metadata that you need for, um, for a session authentication between the CPU and the TPM. And so what we did was we added this key store to have uh, those keys be stored um, automatically for you. So all you need to do is now reference the key using a, a path, as we call it, um, which is just a, a few lines of, uh, just a few characters of text. So you can artificially name your keys. And one, in all TSSs we had uh, the infamous UUIDs that nobody really likes, I guess. Um, now we instead have just character strings which allows users to more easily uh, reference keys. And then the last thing we did was we added a policy language. So um, the TPM has um, a very, very capable, interesting, but also kind of complicated way to do policy um, for satisfaction and policy value calculations. So you're building up hash trees and then you have to satisfy hash trees and provide a set of um, uh, proofs to the TPM via command sequence that a certain policy is actually fulfilled currently. And so we abstracted all of this away and instead we just defined a, a well-suited JSON-based format where you can specify your policies. And all of that goes up to more than 25,000 lines of code that we're currently having for public review in pull requests on the main library, the tools, and uh, the PKCS11 project. And just to give you an idea of what that looks like, so um, as I said, the system API um, yeah, up there um, basically doesn't do anything for you and you have to do everything yourself, especially the metadata handling, so you have quite a lot of code. In eSAPI, the exact same use case would be way shorter because it does all the metadata handling, but you still have to do um, a lot of manual handling of resources with the TPM, uh, telling it which which wants to load, which wants to unload, stuff like that. And with a feature API, it basically boils down, in this case, to one command where there is uh, async and, and finish, so an asynchronous scheme. So it boils down to just one command, which includes automatic satisfaction of a policy. Um, to give you an idea of what that looks like, this is like the simplest policy you can think of, which requires a certain value in the, in the platform configuration registers, so the platform configuration inside the TPM to be all zeros. And on the right-hand side, you see how we represent that in this JSON policy language, just declarative. And, um, but if you're going one, one level deeper into eSAPI, this would be the sequence of functions you would have to call, and you would have to allocate all of these things. And especially, for example, this PCR digest zero thing needs to be calculated by you in advance, so you need to know how exactly to mingle those hashes together. So that's why we try to um, make this a lot simpler here. And the first consumers, as I said, we, we are extending the, the TPM tools for that. And um, the next consumer is gonna be the um, virtual smart card project that we have. So instead of um, requiring you to carry around a smart card and doing authentication that way, um, the idea here is to provide a virtual smart card on your laptop, whatever, and so you can have proof of possession by possessing the laptop instead of the smart card, and you still have the whole, um, the, the second factor, the proof of knowledge by entering the PIN. And the idea is to have a uh, fully compatible uh, PKCS11 implementation here use, that uses the TPM as backing device. And as I mentioned, uh, there's currently some uh, heavy rework happening 
from the or, uh, original ESUS based implementation now going into a feature API based implementation specifically to utilize um, the, the key store capabilities because we have to store the virtual smart card token somewhere but also going forward probably to include some more advanced policies that allow you to further restrict usage of those keys. Having said all that, um, community building. So this is the, the main website that we're currently running and um, let me quickly switch over there. Um, yeah, so this is the, the website where we are just gathering a bunch of resources about specifications, teaching, presentations we're giving. We already have this presentation up there as well with a link. Um, where and how we're packaged, which software supports TPM. We have more badges in there, of course. Um, one thing we've, we're missing so far is a lot of tutorials. So if you're entry level and you're trying to get fam to familiarize yourself with the TPM, we would greatly appreciate if you could just take your experience, put them into a tutorial and send a pull request for the site. And um, of course the latest edition, we have a Gitter in here as well where people can chat. So um, if you have any short, quick questions, feel free to just post them there. One of us is uh, always online thanks to time zone differences. So uh, you might get some quicker answers than on the mailing list. Um, as long as the question is kind of short. Um, yeah. What's missing? Um, well, a lot of the, one of the main capabilities that the TPM used to be marketed with was the attestation capabilities. So we're building up some support for that through the feature API, but um, we still have to see for protocol bindings and whatnot. And um, we, of course, want to have more core system integration. So we are looking at um, network manager for IEEE, what is it, 802.1x um, integration of TPMs. I would love to see my GNOME key ring be um, integrated with a TPM or maybe having GNU PG um, for signing my, my tower balls use the TPM as well. Um, so if any of you are in any of these communities, come and speak to me and maybe we can make something happen. And also, if there's somebody who knows uh, OpenSSL very well, I could use the second maintainer there as well, uh, especially if you know the EVPP key interface. Uh, I would really want to have that implemented. All right, so that was a kind of quick speaking. I'm sorry if I lost some of you along the way, but uh, I guess we have a few more minutes for questions. Yeah. Um, What about uh, hardware attacks to the TPM? Sir? How do you protect, uh, or how is the TPM really protected uh, against hardware attacks? So oh, we are okay. sure that what we put in there is not mm -hmm. side channel attack or stuff like that. So the TCG has defined a protection profile that all compliant TPMs need to fulfill. And this needs to be evaluated following common criteria EAL 4 plus. So that might assure you that nothing's happening or that might not assure you, but that's like um, what they do. And uh, the companies themselves, the, the producers, usually use some technology that's similar to other smart cards or embedded uh, security elements that they sell for TPMs as well. So you get about the same protection level as on those devices. Possibly even more because there's no self-programmed Java card applet running on there, but like all the code stack up to application level comes from the company that's CC evaluated. Okay, but uh, let me rephrase slightly. With the uh, software stacks that we have that is running on the main CPU, how can we avoid, uh, uh, how do we avoid the side channels between the main CPU and the actual TPM? Oh, okay. So. Um, there are several ways you can, or several things you can do. In general, it's a not fully solved problem yet. Um, if you're going for FAPI, then the communication between your main CPU and the TPM is completely encrypted after the provisioning step. Um, the problem, of course, is then you need a trustworthy storage on the CPU side of things. And this is where um, the chicken and egg problem arises from. 
Um, if, you get a, if you get hold on a CPU that has an internal um, secure storage on the, on, on the die or on the SOC, you can store some credentials of the TPM on the CPU and thereby um, from the very, very beginning start with an uh, authenticated communication with the TPM. Um, you can, um, after the fact, do an attestation to prove that. There's uh, some ideas um, running around the uh, TPM DD devil mailing list where you have um, ephemeral sessions so the TPM on every boot creates new secrets and uh, you use those ephemeral sessions in early BIOS and then the, you hand them off the boot chain on the CPU and at a late stage after Linux is booted you can have a remote attestation to check whether those are still the same sessions as they were in the beginning of the boot cycle uh, in order to, ha um, to detect any kind of reset attacks on the TPM. So stuff like that, but uh, the problem itself is not fully fully solved yet. Thank you. So I, <clears throat> I think I'm saying something. Um, I understand how this helps you if somebody takes your hard drive and tries to use it somewhere else. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> if I put a new SD card and it's signed by the same thing, how does, and if I'm not typing a pin, like I'm on a server or mm -hmm. embedded device, how do I bless this hard drive to this TPM so it doesn't trust any other? Oh, okay. Um, so the idea with this crypt setup uh, thing without a password entry was that you initially set up a, a, Lux, a Lux partition, whatever. But instead of storing the credentials on the disk itself, because you have nowhere else to put them, you store them inside the TPM. So if then somebody steals the hard disk, they don't have the key with it. Right. Um, there's no such thing as, I, I guess the initial binding would be the Lux format command, okay. um, where you um, set up the encrypted storage. All right. Um, I think I'm already two minutes over, over my time, so I'll be just standing out in the hallway if you have any more questions um, or comments or whatnot. Thank you.